Welcome to Strip Coverlet, where we squeeze the bigger picture out of literature. I am Adrian Fort, and we are here for another poetry discussion, one of the final poetry discussions of National Poetry Month 2023. 30 poetry discussions in 30 days here on the channel. This brings the list of poetry discussions nigh 180. Uh, we're closing in quickly on 200 poetry discussions. We crossed 150 this National Poetry Month. We crossed 100 last National Poetry Month, it appears that we will cross 200 before next National Poetry Month. Uh, we just keep having poetry on this channel. So if you find yourself here by chance but not design, literature is the only thing I talk about on this channel. Poetry, short stories, novels, writing, those sorts of things. So consider hitting the subscribe button in order to stick around for more. And if you want to help me out with what I'm doing here, hitting the like button tells YouTube to share this video with other literature lovers. And finally, there is a link to my personal channel to be found in the description below. This poetry discussion is going to end with a bit of philosophy. Philosophy is one of the things that I talk about over on my personal channel. So let's get into it here with Robert Frost. We have a poem titled, An Empty Threat, and it reads as such. I stay, but it isn't as if there wasn't always Hudson's Bay, and the fur trade, a small skiff and a paddle blade. I can just see my tent pegged, and me on the floor cross-legged, and a trapper looking in at the door with furs to sell. His name's Joe, alias John. And between what he doesn't know and won't tell about where Henry Hudson's gone, I can't say he's much help. But we get on. The seal yelp on an ice cake. It's not men by some mistake. No, there's not a soul for a windbreak between me and the North Pole, except always John Joe, my French Indian Eskimo and he's off setting traps, in one himself, perhaps. Give a headache over how much bay thrown away in snow and mist that doesn't exist. I was going to say, for God, man, or beast's sake, yet does perhaps for all three. Don't ask Joe what it is to him. It's sometimes dim what it is to me. Unless it be the old captain's dark fate, who, see, who failed to find a force, or force a strait, in its two thousand mile coast, and his crew left him where he, where be failed, and nothing came of all the say, all be sailed. It's to say, you and I, to such a ghost, you and I off here, with the dead race of an empty auk. And, Better defeat almost, if seen clear than life's victories of doubt that need endless talk talk to make them out. We have here a poem from Robert Frost, which is very rooted in reality, but still ambiguous of message. Surprise. Now, what I want to lead this discussion with. Here we are at the end of this poem, and better defeat almost if seen clear than life's victories of doubt that need endless talk talk to make them out. Well, maybe like a Robert Frost poem, but do you remember the title of this poem? We have this image of living in the great white north. We have this idea of leading a rough and tumble life. We have this message of life off the land. Do you remember the title of this poem? As I scroll slowly back up. An Empty Threat. This leads me to one of the greatest, one of the greatest modern quotes from philosophy. Henry David Thoreau, the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. Now, you will find no shortage of variant on this part of the uh, quote. But this part of the quote, lives of quiet desperation, 
that's that's consistent no matter where you find the quote, no matter who is giving you the quote, no matter where it might be that you're going with the quote, that part of the quote that's standardized. An empty threat. An empty threat because the narrator here, our speaker, leads a life of quiet desperation. It isn't as if there isn't always the Hudson Bay. I could do that. I could do that, you know. We all, we all work with this guy, right? We do. We all work with this guy. The guy who says, you know, I don't know if I'm coming back on Monday. I don't know if I'm going to be back. I might just go and find me a job splitting rocks. You know, there's a new factory down the street. I might go ahead and put in my application. I'm tired of working for this guy. We all know this guy. But it is a quiet life of desperation. Here we have a speaker who is willing to concede the sort of, maybe not pointlessness, maybe not emptiness, but a life that is not fulfilling. I think that's fair. Our speaker here is conceding at the very title of this poem that their life is not all that great. Otherwise, why would they give a threat at all? You don't threaten to leave a great life. What does our speaker here do? We don't know. Our speaker here might be the overnight guy at the five and dime. Right? That's what I do. Not, uh, not all that fulfilling. Not a lot of meaning in stocking shelves. But it seems some type of retail or shopkeep or something, because even what it is that this speaker is threatening to do is go out there and run a shop. Go out to the great white north and sell furs. So is there, in this conceit, even an admission of the fact that, yeah, I might go out there on life's great adventure, but even there I'd have to have a job. I don't know anything else. Right? I don't know anything else. What else would I do? I don't know how to trap. I don't know how to hunt. I'm not going to captain a boat. But I could go out there, by God, and I could sell these sons of guns the furs that are brought to me to sell. I know that part. So even in the wild fantasy, even when one is threatening to live the mundane life of quiet desperation, he gets held up in retail. <laughs> um, what does that say? In our wildest fantasies, are we still just as miserable and pathetic as we are in real life? That's a quiet type of desperation, isn't it? I'm not going out there to be the trapper. I might live in a tent, but who doesn't? But I'm not going out there to be the trapper. I'm not going out there to adventure. I'm going... But, but what is the... So if this is, if this is the idea here, that we are going to abandon this life. We are threatening to abandon this life in order to do the same thing in some place that is slightly more dangerous and, ex well, extremely more dangerous, but slightly more exciting. If that is the idea here, why risk it? Well, I'll tell you why. If you're in this regular sort of town, perhaps, from where our speaker might be speaking, working retail, and you're selling clods, and you're selling, I don't know, table pepper, and you're selling the latest doodad, is that really a service? 
are you really providing anything? But if you go out to the Great White North and you end up being a retailer up there and you are selling those furs, by God, somebody needs it. Somebody needs that warmth. So the the idea of the mass of men leading a life of quiet desperation, I think to me what that states is the mass of men leading a lives completely disconnected from meaning. So when you know Henry David Thoreau, this this quote from Thoreau is probably eighteen fifties, right? Somewhere in there you have to think. 40s, 50s, 60s. I don't know the exact time Henry David Thoreau was was living, let alone writing. Um, 1800s, almost no doubt. So, this would have been the first sort of pangs of industrialization. The modernization, mechanization of society, leading you further and further into a comfortable life, yes, much more comfortable. This would have been the time period where the shift from agricultural life to city life was really taking a turn, at least by population, maybe not by mass in the United States, not by mass of land, but by population. And it's, it's a lot harder to have to wake up in the morning and catch your food. It's a lot harder to work up in the, wake up in the morning and have to worry about tilling the field. It's a lot harder. But you know where that food is going. You know where that food came from. Now, well, I go to the super, my best hunting is done at the supermarket. Right? And it's empty. And it's a void of, devoid of meaning. It is a void of meaningfulness. It's a lot easier. Is that the quiet desperation? Being removed from actual meaning? I think so. And I think we have sort of a beautiful encapsulation of that with this poem. Robert Frost, by the way, when was Robert Frost born? Robert Frost was born 1880, something like that. I mean, a long time ago. Robert Frost, in his life, saw a lot of stuff happen. And he lived, I believe, through 1960. So when you think of that time frame, was it 1880? I think, I think Robert Frost was 1880. So when you think of that time frame, 1880 to 1960, he lived from horse and buggy, primary mode of transportation being horse. There's that famous picture of a, a, an intersection in New York taken 10 years apart. 1913 to 1923, I believe. In 1913, there is one car on the road, and the road is packed with horses. 1923, there is one horse on the road, and the road is packed with cars. I believe those are the, those are the times. So Robert Frost lived from horse and buggy times until almost seeing men walk on the moon. That's a wild time frame. That is a wild, um, that is a wild set of expectations by decade. I mean, just decade by decade progress. Think of our lives. I'm I'm 37, born in 1985. Uh, like Peter Thiel and Eric Weinstein often say, if I were to walk into a classroom today and just take out all of the screens, all the screens that you look into, you know, like computer screens, TV screens. If I walked into a classroom right now and took out all of the screens, one small thing, large implications, but one small thing, 
go into a classroom, take out all the screens, you're looking at the same classroom that you would have looked at in 1950. That's the only, that's the only difference. In fact, I'm here in Kansas City. I believe one of the high schools very recently, as in in the last decade, got air conditioning. I'm not kidding. I think there's middle schools that still might not have, like, primary air conditioning. So this, this life that has progressed so dramatically just in Robert Frost's time provided a whole lot more comfort, but a whole lot less inherent intrinsic meaning in the daily actions. So think of, so cars, for example, we gave that, 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 um, example of the cars in New York, pretend you work at a Ford factory. What are you doing all day? You're turning one nut, you're cranking one shaft. I don't know, right? You're doing one thing, though. That is what the assembly line is. And I'm not, I'm not speaking down on anybody, but when you take a step back, you say, if you work at the Ford plant, you build cars. That's what you do for a living. But do you? So how much meaning is it in, to, to your life when one of those cars rolls off the factory line? Hard to find a whole lot of meaning in that. You were petting one part of the elephant all day. And I'm not speaking down on anybody's work. I think everybody's labor now is this way. Like I say, I work retail. Sell a lot of stupid stuff all night. A lot of stuff that nobody needs. They're just coming in to buy. Not a lot of meaning in that. But as with a lot of Robert Frost poems, I think that's what we have here. An act. The fantasization. Fantasization. Fantasizing. The act of fantasizing about a life with maybe a little more heft and meaning, but a lot less comfort. That is all I have for this poetry discussion. An Empty Threat by Robert Frost, if you like what I do here. Hitting the like button tells YouTube to share this video with other literature lovers, and I appreciate that. If you find yourself here by chance but not design, literature is the only thing that I talk about on this channel. Poetry, short stories, novels, writing, things like that. And... If you really want to help me out, there's a link to my personal channel to be found in the description below. Go over there, check me out over there where I talk about philosophy, I talk about movies, talk about things like that. There is poetry every Monday here on Strip Coverlet, and I hope to have you back for the next one.